Hey, Brandon, should we uh, review another EEG today? Yeah, although you're going to have to hold my hand a little bit this time. I, I bumped my head. I, I got a new pogo stick, and I uh, it goes 10 feet in the air, and I just fell right on the back of my head. I'm sorry to hear that. We'll try to make it work then. All right. What do we got here? So we have a 12-year-old. Looks like this kid's awake. I see him blinking a lot. Right. Oh, and they have a pretty nice, uh, what do you call that thing in the back of the head there? Oh, the PDR. Yeah. It's alpha rhythm. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Let's take a look at this one. I'm guessing two, it's about 11 hertz, but I haven't counted. Eight, nine, 10, 11. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right. Yep. You got it. Cool. The pattern recognition is still working. <laughs> thank, thank God. And it's actually a little bit, uh, taller on the right side. Is that, is that expected? Do you remember? I think that is expected because the skull is a little thicker on the left side. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Is that, is that because our language is typically on the left and we need to, <laughs> <laughs> that's your theory. That's right. my theory. That's your theory to, to protect the language, <laughs> to protect the language. Yeah. Yeah. So far Talk. this, and it looks like nice and symmetric. I, I think this kid is uh, so far pretty normal. Why they got the CEG. I think this kid had some absence seizures in the past. Oh, they did, huh? Hmm. I wonder if we're going to we see. We don't know what the story is, though, because we don't want to bias ourselves. Exactly. That's what we do. We just get the age before we look at it. Let me let let me take a look at this here really quickly with you. Look, this is a nice example of not having PDR on the left at the beginning of the page and then an eye closure and then the PDR comes back. So that's a good example of reactivity, isn't it? Yeah, we might we might say this is a, a 11 hertz posterior dominant rhythm reactive to eye closure. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, that's exactly it. Is the nine. ECG uh, normal there? Oh, that's a good point. We, we can't forget to look at the EKG. And I agree. It seems like the intervals between the QRSs are a little bit off. Yeah, I, I'm not sure we have a, anything, you know, we can't really make a diagnosis from this, but it's always you, got, good to mention that. Right. Yeah. So, well, a kid coming in through the ECG lab or the EEG lab actually has a you know, heart problem. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, this is a chance to catch that if it's true. So we true. should mention this when we write our report. Going. So, so far, still awake, a lot of eye blinks, nice PDR, symmetric. Anything else you see? Just a little muscle activity up front. Okay. I hope our um, technologist does some hyperventilation and some photic stimulation. It'll be. That's true. Because if it is absent, it's oh, there you go. HV. Ah, okay, good. Hyperventilation begins. So they may, they're having this kid blow in a pinwheel, I'll bet. Right. And it typically triggers absence seizures, doesn't it? Yeah, sometimes I, I have my patients do that in clinic, just hyperventilate in clinic. Whoa. What is that? What do we have here? That's not normal. I can't remember what this is. You'll have to explain it because of my head injury. Okay. Well, is this normal. I think it's pretty different from everything we've seen so far, right? They're just blinking really fast, <laughs> very ry rhythmically. Yeah, that's a good differential, but I think you forgot that. This, it's in the front. It, it is. It is more in the front. That's a good point. Yeah. But what about these little, little spikies before the slow waves? What do you think about that? Those look like spike and wave complexes. Yeah, I agree. I agree. They are beautiful. They're so stereotyped. Like they, each one looks like an exact copy of the previous one. It's true. Do you think it? Do you think it came? It came up because of the hyperventilation. Yeah, I bet that's what triggered it. Yeah, nice. A minute or two into the hyperventilation here. Right. Okay, I'm Between taking the notes. montage. You want me to switch montage? Okay. Yeah. This is average. Oh yeah, it really is. You know, most prominent in the frontal leads. Right. So FP1, F2, FP2 up there. And it, is it happening uh, kind of simultaneously on the left and the right sides? That's true. It's synchronized, doesn't it? 
Yeah. Pretty this line of weight. If it's just in the frontal, is it vocal? Or is it generalized? Well, we still call it generalized if it's synchronized between the two hemispheres. It's true. So okay. yeah. All right. What else? So how, how do we describe this? How what, what do we have to pay attention to when we're looking at these guys? Well, we should, so we want to um, give other people reading our report a clear idea of what we're seeing. So we would want to, we would say that the, we'd comment on the frequency. Mm -hmm. Looks like there's one, two, three, three spikes each second. So this is a pretty classic three hertz generalized uh, frontally predominant spike and wave pattern. Mm -hmm. Hertz spike and wave. Um, we also would, I think, measure the amplitude um, of the spike and the wave. And mm. we've got a little measuring bar there. Let's take a look. Maybe 350 microvolts. Yeah, these are tall. Okay. Yeah, I'd say about 300, 350. Seems okay. good. And right. the, the, the slow wave is just slightly uh, shorter. So maybe it's 300 microvolts. Well, at least in the front. Um, yeah. yeah. Is it, these are big slow waves. So this is a good example because most of our generalized spike waves are actually more prominent in the frontal regions, right? Yeah, that's really, really typical. Right. What do you think this kid is doing uh, when this happens? That's a good point. I wish we could pull up the video, but it's broken. So uh, we don't <laughs> really know. I, I remember I saw this kid do that. They, they just um, actually paused. They were blowing in the pinwheel. Mm. You know, they just suddenly stopped and stared and mm -hmm. it was really brief and then it was over and they went back to blowing. Uh, are we calling it a seizure then? Yeah, I think, well, yeah, it's a good, I would probably, you could argue about this, right? I think it's maybe a little briefer than we usually, um, than we usually require to call something a seizure. So it looks like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine seconds. So mm -hmm. it's just borderline. Typically, we use a cutoff of 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't think you'd get too many arguments if you just said this was a, a brief absence seizure. And I think with a clinical correlate like we saw, I, I think we should call it a, a brief absence seizure. Okay. Um, All right. Actually, see. I was going to ask you, what, what mm -hmm. um, type of seizure disorder does this person have? Um, yeah, so I was actually looking at the chart here while you were talking about these spikes, and it seems like this patient started having absence seizures at the age of six years. So that fits Good. with maybe childhood absence epilepsy with this EEG in this history. Yeah, I think you're right. This is clearly a generalized one that because of the spike and wave pattern on like both sides simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I think the three hertz spike and wave is very, you know, as soon as you see that, you should think of a, a generalized epilepsy. What do we call those now, nowadays? Um, those epilepsies? Genetic generalized epilepsies? Right. I, I think we, we used to call them idiopathic generalized epilepsy, IgE. Um, but yeah, gen GGE is the new term. Right. Um, and how do you, what, which of the generalized epilepsies do you think this is? So I think I think it fits the childhood absence epilepsy because of yep. the absence seizures and the seizure onset at the age of six ish. Yeah. So the kids with um, juvenile absence epilepsy, which is the other thing you might think of in a kid this age, usually it starts a bit later. I think somewhere around what a twelve or so. Um, and, and what would you tell the parent about the prognosis for this kid, given that we think this is probably a childhood absence epilepsy as opposed to JAE? Yeah, that's a good point. I feel like if it's CAE, they're more likely to grow out of seizure. So I think it's, uh, I think it's actually good news. Yeah, it is good news. Do you think, um, given that they are going to grow out of it, do they need anticonvulsants? I think so. I think, isn't that the ethosuximide, the preferred one, the first line for these seizures? I think so. Yeah, that's pretty efficacious. Um, and I think a reason to treat them, I mean, besides these little absences being disruptive, um, 
they, they, some of these kids about, I think it's about more than half um, will have generalized convulsions, mm-hmm. right? They're not on treatment. Um, fortunately, they're pretty easy to treat is my recollection. They, they tend to respond to medicine pretty well. All right. So let's see what else happens. Are there more of these things? Yeah. Let's just make a summary really quickly here. So what do we know about these spikes and waves? So first they're spike and wave discharges or SW, right? Mm -hmm. We know that there are three Hertz because there are three of them in each second. We know their amplitude is around 300, 350 microvolts. And we also know that they last nine seconds and they may be um, associated with some clinical manifestations. Because- Fabio, I, I, what if, what if, what would you say if, um, you know, that we're not seeing it here, but what if, what if these went on and on and on for a long time? What would we call that? Um, a seizure or a status, absence status? Yeah, right. Yeah, so absence status. Um, when I hear the word status, well, I have a, uh, actually, I have, you know, a, sort of alarm bells go off a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of status as something pretty bad usually, right? Because I, I take care of a lot of patients in the critical care setting and their status is dangerous and it harms the brain. If you have absence status, should you hospitalize the patient and put them on a ventilator and give them anesthetic drugs to make it stop? I don't think you have to be as aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the interesting thing about absence status, unlike other kinds of status epilepticus, it, mm-hmm. it seems to be you know, benign in the sense that the person goes back to behaving normally and you know, there's no evidence that it harms the brain. Of course, mm-hmm. it's not you can't function while this is happening. So that's a problem, but, um, but it, your brain isn't, you know, damaged by it. Um, And there's there's a story, there's a kind of a famous story. I'm not certain if it's really true or not, but Mm -hmm. um, there was a patient who lived in Paris and apparently, uh, you know, this was a long time ago and the best medicine they had was bromides, um, which are pretty sedating. And they, I think they, uh, you know, um, dampen the libido. And so this patient really didn't like to take them. Mm-hmm. And they wandered around streets of Paris mm-hmm. once in a while, you know, reach, you know, running into someone they knew. And so there was, there's a map of where this person ended up wandering around Paris for nine years. Wow. And there was status? confusion. So apparently this person was in absence status. Wow. Ten years. And, uh, but whenever they would take their medicine, they were fine. Huh. So, you can be in status for nine years if it's absence status and uh, be no worse to wear. Wow, wow, that's a good story. And does it does it uh, fall into the category of non-convulsive status then? Yeah, I suppose it sort of does. I mean, yeah. So it it's it uh, maybe highlights a limitation of our terminology, right? Maybe best not to apply the. You, you got to remember what kind of status you're talking about uh, before you decide, you know, how serious it is and whether you ought to, what you ought to do about it. Right. It's a good, it's a good point. All right. Should we call it a day? Call it a day. That's thanks, Brandon. All right. Cool.